Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everyone. So, in the previous classes we have learnt about what are surface properties and bulk properties and how to characterize the surface properties and uh, mechanical characterization of the materials. So, we have learnt about that. So, coming to the final characterization which is biological characterization. So, this is the end game which determines whether your material is biocompatible or not. Which which is basically whether the whatever the implant or devices you are the, uh, producing which, which will be uh, taken by the host system or will be rejected by the host system. So, in biological characterization there are three major categories one is in vitro biomaterial characterization and another is in vivo biomaterial characterization and apart from this there is a separate section which is bacteria biomaterial interaction. So, in vitro is where you will do uh, all the biological related experiments on a lab scale environment. In vivo where you will uh, uh, experiment the material in animal models like rat, pigs, canine species and all. So, bacterial interaction is mainly uh, needed when you are uh, uh, looking for infection on the material surfaces and all. So, when you are implanting a material into the body, so within a nanoseconds the proteins will get adsorbed onto the material surface. So, based on the protein adsorption it determines how the cells are adhering onto the material surface which will lead to the host material uh, host cells and material interaction. Uh, if the cell attachment uh, it continues and if there is a proper cell attachment it will lead to spreading of the cells and then which will lead to the differentiation and migration. So, all these steps will lead to a complete integration of a material into the body. So, based on the application you have to decide what type of uh, uh, interaction you need. So, like if you need a interaction between the cells and the material for the application such as orthopedic implants, uh, wound dressing and all. So, you need your material to be, to be integrated with the host cell. But if you are looking into cardiovascular devices and all where you do not need any cells to be adhered onto the surfaces and all, uh, you should avoid the cell attachment on the material surfaces and all. So, coming into what are the aspects you have to look for the material uh, to be a biocompatible. So, there are lot of aspects based on again application. So, until now whatever the surface property and the bulk property you have uh, analyzed or characterized those can be changed based on the results you are getting. But for this biocompatibility it is entirely dependent on the how the material is interacting with the cells. So, what type of cells you are using and what type of experiment you are doing based on that it will uh, uh, interact with your material. Okay, so, whatever material you have characterized and suitable made up uh, suitable for your application and all it should be uh, attached to the cells based on uh, how effective uh, it can be integrated into the system. So, coming into aspects, so first is sensitization, irritation and inter intracutaneous reactivity. So, this is mainly applicable for wound dressing materials. So, what happens is when you are uh, putting a wound dressing uh, on a particular wound, uh, it should not cause irritation or it should not produce any allergic reaction on the surfaces and all. So, we have to test for that. So, that is uh, that uh, aspect. Then systemic toxicity. So, systemic toxicity involves uh, what uh, duration of uh, toxicity you are going to observe uh, over the period of time. So, toxicity which is a commonly used uh, term for uh, uh, studying the biocompatibility of uh, any scaffolds, hydrogels or the materials. So, what you are basically going to do is whether the material you have produced is leaching out any compound or it is interacting with the cells uh, and killing the cells. So, we have to check that using systemic toxicity. Genotoxicity which is the material which can cause uh, damage to the genes. So, which can lead to mutation and all. So, implantation mainly observed when you are uh, 
using a material uh, which can affect the nearby tissues and organs also. If you are using orthopedic implants and all, it can uh, have an effect on nearby bones and uh, nearby tissues, muscular tissues also. So, based on the where you are implanting, you have to decide, uh, you have to find out the uh, factors affecting that. Hemocompatibility, it is primarily uh, involved for cardiovascular applications where you need to, your material to be fully blood compatible. And carcinogenicity, it is again linked to genotoxicity or the muta mutagenicity, where if there is a mutation, it can lead to uh, cancer causing uh, uh, effects and all, which will lead to further the uh, rejection of your implants. Reproduction and development, it is not uh, uh, primarily used for all the materials, but if there is a possibility, if there is a uh, possibility that your material leachate or your uh, nanoparticles or the molecules which you are using can uh, affect the reprodu reproduction system or the embryonic development stage, it has to be checked for that. Biodegradation, it is uh, uh, used for a lot of uh, applications such as vascular sutures and staples where you are uh, uh, using that material and it should be degraded over the period of time. So, you have to check those things and all, how the cells will uh, degrade those materials and all, you will check in that biodegradation and all. Immune response is basically uh, involving the total immune system, whether the uh, in introduced uh, material is having any uh, antigenic effect so that it will trigger a immunogenic cascade, so that uh, it will lead to inflammation of the uh, site of implant. So, if you are uh, introducing a uh, metal uh, orthopedic implants uh, uh, and if it is causing a uh, leach out uh, uh, immunogenic responses and all that place will have a uh, uh, inflammation occurring. So, these are the major aspects. So, in this one commonly used test for assessing the biocompatibility or cytotoxicity which is the initial test we have to do for all the materials whether that material is killing the cells or uh, it is uh, having an inert effect or it is promoting the cell growth and all. Then hemocompatibility where you have a blood, uh, blood related applications and all. Mutagenicity and carcinogenicity where you will check for any change in uh, muta mutation occurred in the system. Then uh, bone remodeling, it is a separate uh, topic where you can uh, estimate how much of the material is uh, affecting the uh, bone integration or bone growth and all. So, that is bone remodeling. So, in cytotoxicity, I will explain in detail uh, all the assays. Uh, it has a direct and indirect contact and a uh, couple of uh, experiments MTT assay and XTT assay which is used for the, uh, calculating the how much uh, uh, your material is toxic to the cells. Hemocompatibility where these experiments will tell you whether your material is not causing any damage to the blood cells or it is uh, uh, leading to any platelet ag aggregation or the blood clot formation. So, mutagenicity and carcinogenicity, AIMS test and chromosomal aberration and mouse lymphoma assay. So, in AIMS test, we can do it in a bacterial study where uh, a bacteria, usually a salmonella species will be there. So, in that one, uh, we will have a mutant which is having a histidine, uh, uh, lack of histidine uh, gene in that one. So, if there is no histidine supplied in the media, the bacteria cannot grow. Okay. So, uh, you will introduce your compound. So, if it is causing a mutag uh, mutagenic reaction on the gene, uh, it will uh, uh, convert the histidine and it will grow. So, that is the basics of uh, AIMS test. So, by this you can cal uh, observe that whether the AIMS test is, uh, whether the compound you are using is causing a mu uh, mutagenic response or not. So, for all these th test there would be a control where you will have a normal uh, uh, bacterial gene which has a histidine uh, utilizing gene also. So, if it is not uh, enhancing, your compound is not enhancing that, it can uh, uh, suggest that your compound is only uh, changing the gene of the uh, histidine uh, lacking uh, species. So, in chromosomal aberration, we will check how the chromosome uh, uh, is after the uh, mitotic division and all, we will check with the compound and without compound. So, if there is a chromosomal ablation, there would be a either insertion, deletion or translocation observed on the chromosomal, chromosomal structure. So, that can be observed in chromosomal ablation. So, mouse lymphoma assay is similar to AIMS assay, but we will do it in a mouse lymphoma cells. 
So, in this cells uh, which will have a uh, thymidine kinase uh, enzyme, so that would be knocked out in a uh, knocked out mice. So, if you are compound is uh, and they will supply a thymidine. So, if your compound can mutate the uh, cells, then it can use that thymidine. So, by that you will uh, understood that your uh, compound is uh, uh, causing any mutagenic response or not. So, in bone remodeling, so the main factors we will look at. Uh, look up all alkaline phosphatase uh, assay. So, it in bone remodeling when you are using a dental implant and other orthopedic implants where you have a bone cements and all uh, that will lead to integration of the host cells osteoblast cells and all lead to formation of increased in uh, calcium content, phosphate content uh, and uh, osteocalcin is, uh, is a uh, major molecule for the uh, uh, bone cells. So, if there is an increase in these factors and all, you can actually estimate them using these assays and all and found that that uh, whatever the uh, bone scaffold or the whatever you are the material is introducing, it has an effect on the improving the uh, bone cell integration within your scaffold and all. So, systemic toxicity. So, LP enzyme what it does is it converts uh, phosphates to inorganic phosphates uh, and all. So, other phosphate derivatives into inorganic phosphates. Those phosphates are major content of uh, bone. So, they are the basic components calcium phosphates. Uh, uh, so, there are a lot of phosphates. So, based on that you will uh, understood that if there is a higher activity then there is a faster growth of bone uh, tissue and all. Okay. So, systemic toxicity determines uh, uh, how long the uh, implant you are going to use it in a system. So, acute system where you will uh, use it less than 24 hours and all uh, which is uh, uh, people use uh, catheters and all uh, to do angioplast and uh, other treatments and subacute uh, which is 24 hours to 28 uh, days. Uh, then subchronic 28 days to 90 days uh, urinary catheters and all it would be within uh, 2 months or 3 months they will remove it. Then chronic which is above 90 days uh, so you have to test uh, uh, whether the material is uh, not having any effect on the cells uh, surrounding it. So, those chronic will involve all the uh, bone, uh, bone implants and cardiovascular implants and all. So, based on this uh, time duration we have to check the material. Uh, it is uh, exactly um, up till that time it is not having any adverse effect on the uh, cells and so coming into toxicity so this is a primary test we, we will do for all the materials either it's a, a hydrogel scaffold or the nanoparticles whatever the material so we have to check whether it is accepted by the cells or not so that can be done based on three different methods direct contact indirect contact illusion or extract assay so, all these variation is based on uh, what is your uh, uh, sample and uh, what type of sample you are having. Direct contact is where you have uh, as you can see in the figure the first one where you have glona cells on the uh, uh, tissue culture plate and you put your sample on the top of it and check whether it is affecting any, uh, uh, any of the cells underneath it. So, that can be done for your nanoparticles uh, or the uh, not having too much load uh, uh, samples. So, if you are having too much load it can destroy your cells uh, automatically. So, indirect uh, test which is uh, done using there would be agar layer on the top of the cells and your sample would be there uh, in that which if your sample is leaching out some compounds or some uh, uh, erosion or some other uh, drugs are releasing from the uh, material then that can leach out and uh, affect the cells underneath it. So, that is indirect contact. So, uh, indirect contact can be done uh, based on the uh, how it is uh, uh, interacting with the cells also. So, as you can in the right hand side top figure where first you grow the cells on a filter membrane. So, then after the cells are adhered onto the surfaces and all then you invert it and then uh, you will put the sample on the top. So, your sample is not exactly in contact with the cells, but the leachate of your sample would be uh, going into the cells and whether it, if it has any effect it will kill the cells uh, or if it promotes the cells it will uh, have that effect. 
So, extraction or the elution assays are the used for soft materials uh, uh, where you can keep that material uh, in a media for uh, 24 hours or 48 hours based on your uh, application. Then you have to extract the media. If there is a leach out from these compounds, uh, you can take that media and culture it uh, in that uh, with the cells or with the, the indirect test method. So, you have the cells, you have the extracts, extracted media that whether that leachate has any effect and all you can test it. So, all these things are based on the sample size and uh, how effective the leachate is coming out of the sample and all. So, if there is no leachate coming out of the sample it would not have any effect and all. So, for that you can move on to the next one of uh, test which is involves which is which involves uh, uh, cell adhesion and uh, proliferation. So, all these texts uh, all these experiments can be done for the, uh, those uh, assays also where you keep your sample at first then you see the cells on the top of them. So, at this uh, uh, toxicity measures how much of uh, your material is toxic and all. So, if you found out that material is not toxic not causing any effect. Uh, for all these uh, assays and all, then you can go for cell adhesion. So, whether your material is promoting cell adhesion and all, because cell adhesion is very important when you are integrating your uh, material with the host system and all. So, for that you will have the sample at the bottom and the cells would be seeded at the top of the material and if over the period of time if the cells are having added uh, adhesion property based on your material surface and all, uh, that can be estimated also. So, for all the assays while involving bio, uh, biological characterization control is very important. You should have a positive control and negative control. Negative control as such uh, there would be a standard uh, of uh, mm. material. So, if you are testing a uh, orthopedic implants and all there would be a standard material uh, stainless steel uh, 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 stainless steel would be there. So, you have to test that material for cytotoxicity. So, the negative control would not have any effect on the cells and all. There would be a positive control also. So, the positive control will have a maximum effect, maximum killing effect on the cells and all. So, based on those only you can within that range only you can decide whether your material is uh, uh, cytotoxic or not. So, usually uh, according to literature if your material causes uh, uh, below that uh, below 70 percentage uh, decrease in uh, cell, uh, cell viability then that your material is not suitable for the uh, biological application and all. So, now we saw how the experiment to uh, identify your material is uh, toxic or not. So, how exactly you uh, identify that thing? So, that can be done by qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative involves you observe them uh, visually using microscope. So, you can use a normal dye like trifan blue or calcium AM and uh, propidium iodide. So, calcium AM will uh, go inside the cells and it will uh, bind with the cyto, uh, cytoskeleton and it will uh, give a green fluorescence. And uh, propidium iodide which will go and bind to the uh, nucleus and it will give a red color. So, if there is a cell death and all uh, you can use these stains and uh, identify uh, whether the cells are live or dead you can observe them under the fluorescence microscope and all. So, that is a qualitative test and quantitative test there are a lot of uh, assays uh, there. So, these are the commonly used one. So, MTT, XTT and MTS. So, all these are the uh, tetrazoleum salts. So, what it does is so using a electron receptor it will convert into formazone. So, so, the formazone will give a different color. Uh, in MTT uh, what happens is it will go inside the cells and mitochondrial dehydrogenase it will uh, uh, reduce the MTT and it will form a formazone crystals. So, in MTT uh, it is a final uh, step of the reaction where you will kill off all the cells and all, but in XTT, MTS and alumal blue and all cells would be alive because in MTT the formazone formed is the formazone crystal formed is inside the cells. So, you have to estimate uh, how much of the uh, quantity of uh, formazone has been formed and all. So, you have to rupture the cells and uh, dissolve them using a solubilizing agent like DMSO and all to, to check the absorbance of the uh, formazone crystals formed. 
whereas in XDT and MTS, uh, which are water soluble uh, uh, tetrazoleum salts, so it happens outside the cells itself uh, with the help of uh, uh, phenazine methosulfate PMS. Uh, it uh, involves uh, uh, plasma membrane electron transport, uh, which converts these tetrazoleum salts into formers and dye. And without rupturing the cells, you can directly dissolve it in a culture media or the buffer and check the uh, formazan, amount of formers and crystals formed and all. The formers and formed is not insoluble? In MTT. No, in XTT and MTS. No, it is water soluble. So, can you use the same cells again for some other experiment? Hmm, yeah, you can wash those cells and you can observe it for, but uh, if you keep on repeating that, uh, the cells will obviously die. So, you can immediately take out and you can use that. So, next to that is alumal blue assay, which involves this is in dye. So, this dye uh, uh, involves a uh, cytoplasmic. Uh, uh, redox reaction. Uh, so, it goes into the cells and uh, uh, due to redox reaction, it will convert into this or the fin, uh, which will uh, give a pink color. So, uh, compared to these above three methods, this is a highly sensitive method, where you can uh, estimate uh, even a very small uh, amount of cells also. And it has another advantage that it has a fluorescent uh, uh, fluorescent property also. So, you can uh, uh, using fluorescent spectrophotometer, you can uh, calculate even a minor change in the cell uh, quantity also. So, for all these things, there would be a control. So, where you do not treat your uh, cells with any of your samples and all and there would be uh, another control where uh, there would not be any cells, but whatever the material you are using will, uh, will be in the media also. Because those controls are very important because uh, all these uh, involve colorimetric assays. So, if your material is changing the uh, media pH or any other uh, color adding colorimetric value to the system, then it, the uh, results obtained can be of a false positive. So, to avoid that we should always have the control in all of the assays and all. So, this is the methods for cytotoxicity. So, after cytotoxicity, if your material is not toxic, you can go for the cell adhesion and all. So, cell adhesion, it is involved the same list of uh, uh, procedures it, uh, itself, where you can uh, put your sample underneath the cells before seeding. So, in cytotoxicity, what you do is, you seed the cells, you grow them, you make them uh, for all these uh, uh, animal cell lines, it has to have a substrate to attach onto the Atta attach attachment should be there. So, you have a tissue culture plate, your cells would be properly spread on the tissue culture plate and then you put on your material, if it is causing toxicity that would be observed. In cell viability or the cell adhesion assay, what you do is you put your material and then you seed the cells onto the material surface. Material means any flat surface material or scaffold and all. So, if based on your surface properties, whether it is hydrophilic or it has a any uh, Mm. receptor uh, ligand, ligand for the cell receptors and all. Based on that, the cells will attach and you can estimate the amount of cells attached onto the uh, material you are having. So, coming into uh, cell motility and cell migration assay. So, these are uh, next stage of uh, characterization where it is pre predominantly used in wound healing application. So, in wound healing application, what you have is there would be a uh, wound separating a uh, two different tissues, so you uh, same tissue, so you have to join them. So that can be done using this scratch assay. So you have a material, you seed the cells onto the material, and you scratch them, and whatever your compound which will uh, enhance the healing property and all. So you put that compound and check whether how the wound is uh, getting closed. So as you can see in the figure, so the left side one is control, and the right side one is. Uh, uh, treated uh, uh, samples. So, they first grown cultures, then they using a small uh, tip or uh, spatula, they create the wound. So, in the left hand side, there would not be any treatment at all. In the right hand side, they have used uh, anona squamosa extract, uh, which is a extract of a custard apple, 
leaves. So, they have used it and as you can see the wound has been closed within 2 days and all. So, it has a wound healing property. So, by this you can identify uh, how much of uh, how fast your wound can be healed using a different uh, concentration of compound and different uh, composition of the compound and all. So, HDF is human dermal fibroblast. So, it is a skin cells. So, dermal fibroblast. So, uh, whatever the material you are using, if it is uh, uh, non toxic to one type of cell, does not mean it is uh, non toxic to all type of cell. So, each cell has a different property and different uh, uh, mechanism. So, you, based on the application, if you are going for the Bo, uh, bone application and all you have to check with the osteoblast cells and if you are going for the vascular application you have to check with the endothelial cells and if you are going for the wound healing application you have to check with fibroblast cells and all. So, each cells has a different attachment property and different uh, effect on the uh, material surfaces and all. So, that you have to always uh, think. So, another important uh, segment in biocompatibility is hemocompatibility. So, hemocompatibility it is specific to uh, blood related application. So, it did, if a material is hemocompatible, it has a good uh, blood compatibility. Uh, for example, if you uh, consider the uh, heart valves, uh, vascular grafts and all, there you have a continuous contact with the blood uh, uh, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the time. So, at the time of implantation and at the time of removal. So, there would be a continuous contact of the uh, blood cells with the material. So, if there is any thrombus, so what is thrombus formation? So, thrombus is a blood clot, so which is formed by uh, adhesion of platelets and fibrin uh, mesh formed onto the surfaces. So, first platelet will adhere onto the material surface, uh, then aggregation happens. So, if one platelet get adhered, it will send out extracellular signals which will uh, activate the surrounding platelets and all. It will uh, uh, act as a homing beacon for uh, making the other platelets to come into its uh, uh, nearby uh, area and it will form an aggregate that is called platelet aggregation. So, when that stable platelet aggregate has been formed there would be a parallel reaction coagulation cascade happens which forms a fibrin mesh. So, that fibrin mesh acts as a network uh, which will trap this platelet aggregates and form a blood clot. So, if you are having a vascular graft and if a blood clot is formed onto the uh, uh, on its surfaces and all it will lead to stroke and uh, the, the uh, complications and all. So, in the right hand side uh, it is an example of uh, how surface modification can improve the hemocompatibility. So, the top one they have uh, used a CTI coated uh, uh, catheter. So, CTI is a contrypsin inhibitor, so which will inhibit the uh, clot formation and the bottom one is uh, without any uh, without any coating. So, as you can see based on this study you can identify uh, a material can be uh, avoid clot formation or not. So, what are the experiments you can do for hemocompatibility? The uh, main experiment is platelet adhesion because that is the initial step of uh, thrombus formation. So, that can be observed using SEM. So, you incubate your sample with platelets, you extract uh, healthy uh, platelets from human volunteers, then you can uh, check how the platelets are adhering onto the material surface and you can observe it under SEM or you can quantitative using uh, previous whatever the uh, cytotoxicity experiments you can MTT assay also you can quantify. There is an assay called lactate dehydrogenase activity assay which all involves the live platelets uh, uh, using the uh, reductase enzyme it will uh, uh, using a uh, reductase enzyme and forming a colorimetric uh, product which will uh, lead to quantification of these platelets. So, all these things you should have a standard. So, you how to count the number of cells and what is the number of cells having that effect. Uh, like in MTT uh, for the particular absorbance what is the number of cells. So, you have to make a standard and all. So, from that only you can calculate the actual number of cells on your material surface or how much of has been uh, reduced or increased from the control and all. So, standard is very important for all this biological. Uh, other than uh, platelet adhesion there is a commonly used assay which is called hemolysis. So, hemolysis as the name suggests uh, uh, the lysis of the hemoglobin uh, erythrocytes. So, whenever the 
your the RBCs are uh, broken down, it will uh, uh, release hemoglobin that can be uh, estimated using UV visible spectroscopy. Uh, so, based on the standard uh, international organization for the uh, standardization, uh, hemolysis index should be uh, below 2 for the non hemolytic material, it should not have any uh, clot uh, formation on the material surfaces and all. If it is slightly hemolytic, it is the range is 2 to 5 and if it is highly uh, uh, hemolytic, it is above 5 which is not at all recommended for any applications. So, hemolysis is calculated based on absorbance of the sample minus uh, absorbance of the negative control by uh, post absorbance of positive control minus absorbance of negative control. So, what are the negative and positive controls are? Uh, negative control uh, is a normal saline solution which does not uh, have any effect on the uh, all basis. Positive control can be uh, either water or triton X where it will lyse the cells uh, immediately on contact with the uh, all basis. And sample is where whatever sample you are having. So, whether that sample will have uh, any effect on all basis that is the sample. So, based on this you will find out the hemolytic index and uh, uh, identify a material is uh, uh, blood compatible or not. So, other than these methods there are the partial thromboplastin time uh, which which is to estimate the amount of uh, which estimate the time required for the thrombus formation. So, you have your control material and you have your sample material and in control material you put on your uh, uh, blood sample in both of them and you add a coagulation factor in both of them. So, coagulation factor which will uh, lead to thrombus formation. So, if your material is non hemo uh, which is avoiding uh, uh, thrombus formation there would be a delay in thrombus formation whereas, in this reference material it would be immediately formed. So, based on that uh, you find out the uh, partial thromboplastin time and you can look into markers uh, of uh, coagulation cascade like uh, C 3 8 C 5 8. So, all these are there is a series of uh, uh, pathway involved for the uh, involved in the coagulation cascade. So, you can check for the particular markers whether it is in inactivated or activated state and all from that you can identify that uh, uh, the material which you are inserting is activating the blood cells and uh, causing this coagulation uh, cascade and all because it is a serious uh, issue that if a small clot also forms if it get detached from the surfaces it can go and block uh, somewhere in the arteries uh, where which is called uh, emboli that uh, movable clot is called emboli. So, that can block the arteries and it, it can lead to serious issues. So, when you are looking for a blood contacting application you should always do the hemocompatible studies and all. So, coming into bacterial uh, interaction with the biomaterials. Uh, uh, one of the major complication immediately arises when you are the introducing a material into the system is infection. So, if there is an infection there would be an immediate rejection because if there is a bacterial infection on the material surface it can uh, lead to immune responses and all other uh, toxic to the cells and all. So, it would be immediately rejected by the cells. So, we have to make the material as much as possible to avoid any bacterial adhesion and uh, uh, forming a bacterial adhesion on the surfaces and all. So, this is majorly observed and uh, it is majorly observed in uh, dental plagues where uh, you have a dental implants where you have lot amount of bacteria uh, uh, exposed to the material and all and uh, infection on urinary catheters. So, urinary catheters uh, there would be a lot of uh, bacteria excreted and all. So, there is another place and orthopedic prosthetics uh, there also if there is a little bit of uh, bacterial uh, interaction is that that can lead to infection uh, serious issues. In normal condition the bacterial would be as a uh, planktonic state uh, which is uh, suspension in the liquid uh, solution, but when this bacteria is adhering onto the material surface it becomes a sessile state which will lead to the formation of biofilm. So, what are biofilm? So, as a normal bacterial adhesion it is reversible. So, uh, due to shear force and all it can be easily removed off from the surfaces and all. But uh, when a bacteria adheres and it forms aggregates and all it then changes its uh, metabolism and uh, uh, secretes uh, exopolysaccharides. Uh, 
So, these exopolysaccharides what they do is they cover this bacterial aggregates uh, and form a thin biofilm mantle. So, these exopolysaccharides will uh, protect them from the uh, uh, immunogenic uh, cells and all uh, thereby it, it will be there for over a long period of time. And whenever the host uh, immune system is low, this can come out of the exopolysaccharides and it can infect the nearby tissues and cells and all. So, bioflame is a major problem uh, and your material should be uh, avoiding the bioflame formation as much as possible. For bioflame uh, estimation, uh, you can uh, there are two basic uh, methods one is turbidimetry measurement and uh, another one is a plate count measurement. So, in turbidity measurement, uh, you measure the uh, number of uh, bacterial cells based on the turbidity uh, observed. At, uh, uh, at OD of 600 nanometer, it is a standard for observing bacteria, you can estimate the amount of bacteria. Uh, so, you have a control, you have uh, your sample and all, uh, you inoculate the control with the bacteria and you have your sample and inoculate uh, with the bacteria. And uh, after the particular amount of time when the uh, bacteria reaches its uh, log phase and all, you will check for how much of the uh, bacteria has lead to uh, ad adhered onto the material surface and all. So, from that we have to wash out the bacteria adhered onto the surfaces and all and estimate using UV visible spectrophotometer. Uh, it is not exactly by uh, gram negative bacteria, it depends on the material properties also. Uh, predominantly, it is on gram negative bacteria. But uh, if your material is having a very rugged surfaces and all, bacteria can go and uh, bind into the uh, pits and uh, wherever the cones are there. So, it can bind into the depth of the material surface and it would be stay there for a longer period of time. So, when it leads to aggregation, then it forms a uh, biofilm, both gram negative and gram positive. They do not study uh, interaction of fungi with bioinfection? Uh, fungi infection, uh, it is not uh, very widely studied uh, because you need a uh, like bacterial infection, fungi infection, uh, you need a uh, environmental condition, a different environmental condition than a bacterial condition. So, and it can be easily killed off fungi as well. So, bacteria, even if you sterilize it, that can uh, it can form a resistance uh, be available for the longer period of time. Even they study the sterilization techniques for the materials and also. After sterilization, how much of uh, sterilization residual is uh, still there, that also has to be studied according to the standards and all. So, bacteria is the major uh, problem that is in front of. So, coming into plate count method, where you uh, estimate the amount of bacteria adhered using a colony forming unit. So, the procedure involves similar to turbidometry measurement. Uh, in plate count, let, uh, plate count method, so you inoculate your uh, uh, sample with the bacteria and you take out the sample and you wash off the uh, uh, so, uh, biofilm uh, using solubilizing uh, solution and all. Then you dilute those samples and you spread it on an agar plate. So, based on how many colonies formed, so each single cell will have a form a single colony. So, based on how many colonies it has been formed, you can estimate the amount of bacteria adhered onto the material surface and all. So, the optimum plate count uh, should be around uh, 30 to 300. So, as you can see in the left hand side, it is a very dense one where it is not an accurate method and in the right hand side only below 10, uh, below 30 is there. So, that is also not uh, uh, standard one. So, it should be in the mid range between 30 to uh, 300. So, that will give you the uh, correct value of bacteria added onto the material surfaces. So, for all these things you have to uh, characterize your materials uh, uh, before that uh, uh, surface characterization and bulk characterization. So, that uh, you have you should have the idea that it should avoid the uh, bacterial addition, it should uh, promote the cell addition, it should avoid platelet addition. So, all those things you have to do before the 
biological characterization. So, how you can uh, overall fl uh, fl flow chart for how you can uh, uh, plan your uh, plan for the uh, producing a material is first you have to uh, categorize what type of uh, device uh, either the orthopedic implant or you are going to be a wound dressing material or hydrogels or the nanoparticles. So, based on the application there are a lot of standard uh, description given already on ISO, ASTM, uh, FDA. Uh, so, all those uh, people they have a standard uh, protocols and all you have to do all those uh, tests for that. Then based on the relevant literature you have to identify whether that will have the effect uh, based uh, for your particular application and all. Then you have to what are the testing condition and instrumentation needed. Then the sample size, so you based on the sample size also the cytotoxicity varies. So, there is a certain guidelines given uh, by ISO that uh, based on if you are using a nanoparticle ratio, how many, how much of amount of nanoparticles you can use for the, how, how much number of cells and all available. Because uh, uh, when you are taking it to in vivo studies and all, you will consider that for body mass ratio. So, if you are taking a capsule or drug, you will, that would be based on how much body weight you have to take that drug and all. So, sample size occurs uh, important for materials also. So, if your material is uh, having toxicity if uh, you have a bigger sample and all you would not use that much big sample when you come to application. So, you have to reduce the sample size and all. Then you have to uh, finally go for cost and time involved for uh, developing that material. So, these are the standards uh, uh, given by ISO. So, each of the standards has a different uh, uh, set of guidelines for the performing uh, different uh, uh, applications uh, uh, such as. Uh, uh, 109935 which only involves in vitro cytotoxicity what, whatever the toxicity experiments I have mentioned it will uh, give you the clear guidelines of whether the, if your material is uh, flat surface and all how you can do and if your material is scaffold or hydrogel and all how you can do. So, like that each of these standards will give you what are the parameters you have to follow for the. Uh, characterizing the biological compounds. So, if all this characterization has been done, then you have to finally take into in vivo. So, in vivo also similar to in vivo, uh, in vitro only, uh, but after the implanting into a uh, animal model, you have to sacrifice the animal and take out the sample again uh, out and check for the histopathology and all surrounding the implanted uh, devices and all. So, all those things you have to again how much of cells are added onto the surfaces and all. Uh, whether it has caused any immunogenic responses and all. So, all those things you have to do for that.